I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. first memory of anything to do with the war was of being in the kitchen of our house and the wireless was on. I call it the wireless because that's what we called it in those days. And my mother was listening to the news and she said to me, go and tell your father that Germany has invaded Poland. And I remember very clearly that I didn't know what the word invade meant wasn't a word I'd ever heard before or come across, and I had no idea of its meaning. But I could tell from the way in which she said that how important it was and that there was some urgency to run up the corridor to wherever my father was in the front of the house and tell him that Germany had invaded Poland. I remember listening to the radio and hearing, hearing them, the, outbreak, the war being announced and my father had been expecting it for days, but it was, a, you know, everybody crowded round the radio and everybody had their ear to it listening. I can remember that very clearly. I can remember, I remember the day war was declared. As I say, I was sat on the hearth rug and uh, I heard um, the announcement and everybody looked at each other and thought, oh God, what's coming now? I saw my father reading a newspaper and it said bomb, and I thought, what's, what's bomb, what does that mean? And that was my first indication there was something not quite right. Mm. Uh, there was this dull period, you, you know, uh, before the London Brit started, and I think people in London were um, lulled into a false sense of security. I, we always laugh and say my mother lived in a war-free zone, our house, because she was very reluctant to get our gas masks. Uh, but we did eventually get the gas mask and our ident identity cards and ration books, of course, because she needed those for food. But no, if they weren't afraid, then why would we be afraid? No, not concerned at all. Not throughout the whole of the Blitz, I wasn't afraid, even with the bombing. Um, we weren't scared. At least I wasn't. I don't suppose the others were. My father joined the air raid wardens and was quickly made chief warden of the Pennsylvania district and um, mother joined something called the Housewives League and the Housewives League um, came to our house and in fact a lot of we had quite a large house and a large garden and um, so a lot of the activities of both the ARP wardens in training and the Housewives League came actually to our house so the house became incredibly busy there were there were people always coming and going. Whether we were a bit posh, I don't know, but she cut up net curtains and stuck on the windows instead of the tape. We started a, a cottage industry, well, it was like a cottage industry. We were making camouflage nets through the uh, Ministry of Defence. And I can recall big balls of string being brought into the house, stack, stacked up uh, in, in the living room. Uh, and uh, my mother was very adept at making these nets and I quickly uh, found out to wind the string on the needle to keep her supplied uh, and then I got into making them as well and I think we got paid half a crown for each net 
took us, oh, I don't know, three or four days to make a net, you know, they, they were quite big. My dad was a painter and decorator, so he always had very nicely painted silver railings and front gate. They took all that away and they just left little stubs of metal and they went to St Thomas Church, as they must have done all the churches in Exeter, and took all the railings away. And if you see St Thomas Church now, there's still little stubs showing where they took everything away, all the metal. And there were convoy after convoy of troops arriving. Uh, obviously a uh, Canadian who had been landed either at Falmouth or Plymouth uh, and there was, you know people were cheering them as they were going through and uh, it was for a kid it was quite entertaining in that. Oh yes, the bottom of Dunsford Hill, I asked my sister to confirm this, Do you, was I imagining it? No. Uh, the bottom of Dunsford Hill, uh, there are what we called as children dragon's teeth, large concrete blocks angled at the top and they were sort of zigzagged so that cars and lorries could get through but I suppose it was to stop tanks coming down from Dunsfield and I thought today how would tanks get from the coast to Dunsford Hill? <laughs> they'd, they'd come across Dartmoor wouldn't they? Lumbering across now, somebody in Exeter City Council suddenly thought we ought to stop tanks coming down the hill. <laughs> Never occurred to us, of course, as children to think, what are they for to stop tanks? Anyway, that's what, that's what they were there for. And all along Dawlish Warren Beach, from the rocks to Exmouth Warren, was scaffolding, about 15 foot high, all interlaced, all along the beach. Yeah, that was to stop enemy landing craft coming in. Yes, so we won't be invaded by sea either. The, the wardens came around to do their stirrup pump practice, for instance. Um, my elder brother and I had to keep the fire going, so they'd got something to put out. That was our job. And um, the Housewives League came and occupied our nursery. And um, mother taught them how to make all sorts of things. Make, do and mend was the, that was the slogan. You had to uh, grow, dig for victory and make do and mend. You will be familiar with all those slogans, I'm sure. But um, it all it all happened. We did dig for victory a lot. Uh, <laughs> so and we kept hens and all those kind of things because we could. We had the space. We were very fortunate. And um, rationing started, and that became an, an issue. One of my jobs, um, I suppose, when I was a little bit older, was to go to the food office, which was in Hevitry Road, in a large house called Loma Loma. Well, because there were so many of us, it eased the food quite considerably. If you were only one on your own in a house, a little one ounce of margarine or butter um, wasn't very helpful, but it, with more of us, it was a lot easier to get by. Um, and then we had the dried eggs, of course, the American dried eggs, which make lovely cakes and lovely scrambled eggs. That must be at least 80 years old. <laughs> um, but it was sweets that I missed most, sweet coupons. Uh, they had to be cut out so you couldn't, or scratched out, meat was scratched out, but sweet coupons were cut out. And I did miss sweets, like one bar of chocolate, I don't know, a fortnight or a month, something terrible like that. Um, and when sweets came back on off the ration, uh, it was a real treasure, real joy to be able to go and buy sweets. Didn't have any ice cream, didn't have bananas or oranges, anything like that. People were poor. There was no question about that, we were poor. I mean, we never had meat as children, perhaps on a Sunday. Or when I say we didn't, uh, we had, if we had meat, it was mainly rabbits. I think we were healthier because the, the rations were enough for you, and but you couldn't, uh, nobody put on a lot of weight, <laughs> which I think in those days was, was quite a good thing. The, the food was quite scarce. Um, eggs and butter and milk and all that sort of thing. Mr Richards, in who had a grocer's shop in Old Tiverton Road, um, he took rather a shine to my mother, I think, and. Uh, once slipped her some extra something, tea, sugar, I don't know, but a little extra something, which she bore triumphantly home and um, was told off 
by my father, who was furious, and uh, who made her take it back and um, tell Mr. Richards that, no, we didn't want any favours, thank you. So he was a very law-abiding man, my father. <laughs> um, in school, uh, we were all allocated a house around the school, so in pairs we had to go to a particular address around the school uh, and wait there until the all clear sounded, and then we go back to school. And sometimes it happened twice, three times a day that we were in and out of school, so um, it interrupted our learning really, because by the time you got your stuff together and moved to the new house, and then back to school and settled down, got everybody back. Um, it would take quite a while to get us all back to start to carry on what we were doing. At school we had exercises to practice with our gas masks. We all had gas, gas masks which we had to take to school and they'd be hung on our pegs with our, along with our coats. And every now and then we'd have a sort of false fire alarm and all go down to the cellar of, the, of Wynne Leighton, the house, the main house of the school. Um, and we all had to embroider, not embroider, we had to blanket stitch rugs so that we all had our own rug with our name on it. And um, that we had to take with us if we went down to the cellar in case. Um, two of our teachers were killed one night, uh, Miss Saunders and Mr. Fowler. And because we were all sitting in class and then after came in and said that Mr. Fowler and Miss Sanders would be arriving this morning but we must carry on and that was it there was no um, we didn't get any funerals or anything that didn't go to any do we you know yeah. just carried on as normal you know uh, which I know compared to what happens today uh, it, you know it's such a such a big difference life had to carry on uh, looking back on it, from my long years of being a parent and a grandparent, with all the experience that you gather in those years, how extraordinarily protected we were as children, my brothers and myself, from the real awfulness of what was going on. I think our parents made a great, took a great deal of trouble to kind of uh, cosset us so that um, we were not... We were aware of the importance of everything, but not somehow um, the risks, the danger. We were down on the playing fields there, and this was just after the Dunkirky rash facing. Uh, and um, in the distance, we saw the RAF forcing a, a plane down. It looked like a Westland Lysander, and one we assumed that it had been. Uh, occupied by a German party, so I'll never know, but, you know, quite excitement for, the, for us. There was one moment fairly early on in the war when several families decided to send their children abroad uh, to places of safety, Canada, the States, and I can remember my father saying, we are not going to send you to Canada. Uh, if we're going to die, we're all going to die together. I do remember that. And of course, some of those families died on the way to Canada in the convoys. I was terribly upset when I heard about it. But I had relatives in Canada that I could have gone to. I didn't know them. Not until after the war, but uh, I didn't want to leave England. I didn't want to leave Exeter, full stop. <laughs> and then, um, in one occasion, when my brother and I were going to be evacuated to New Zealand, because um, we got distant relatives out there, I don't know, like some cousin of my grandfather or someone, they got a bit of a sheep farm at Christchurch. And uh, arrangements made for us to stay with them, and um, we got uh, all the paperwork about it, and that got all the paperwork done, and we got forms, and 
uh, they sent us labels to tie on our coats and we had to wait until we got instructions to go to Southampton. And <coughs> so we're patiently waiting. And the next thing is um, an evacuee ship going to Canada got torpedoed the city of Benares and a lot of school children and their teachers were lost on that so the government cancelled the, the block on them. So we never did get the news even. This is well. I don't want to feed the fish. I think the war impinged on our on our childhood almost like a an elaborate game. My brother decided that we should learn how to be saboteurs and so forth and uh, work for the underground if necessary, if we were to be invaded. So we, we invented all sorts of games in which we had to get from one place to another without anybody seeing us and convey messages and so on. Back in those days, every solicitor or professional office had an office had a boy. And I used to be friends with most of the boys who, who were office boys in Exeter at that time. Firms that are still there now. They had office boys like 15, 16 years old. And we'd all get together. And a lot of the fire washing was done because boys earned money, two and six a night. Men who couldn't make it and had to go fire watching instead of staying, you know. And I say, four shillings a night for night watch, or for fire watch. And then, of course, we'd all been trained to use the stirrup pump and the, the shovel and the sand and the bucket. <laughs> it was so pathetic when you look at it, think of it today. But uh, no doubt, fire watchers saved a lot of property throughout the UK. When we were on duty, we had a, a program when we had to be on duty fire watching. And we'd meet down in Queen Street, somewhere around Queen Street. And that was it, great fun. Chase each other, throwing things at each other, all across the roof. Mad, mad. Looking back now, I shouldn't have done it, but when you're 16, 17, 18, anything went. Plymouth was, I think, one of the first to get it. And we used to get a warning then if Plymouth was uh, being attacked by siren, which was unwound siren. And um, we used, people used to just um, go about their normal business unless there was an air raid warning. And then they would go to the air raid shelters that was built on the streets and shelter in them. At night, very often, they would um, not wait for any alarm to go. They would go to the fields and camp out in case there was an air raid. Um, as soon as the sirens, when they first went off, you know, they were just testing them. Um, but then there came a time when Father had decided that in the event of an air raid, we should all go down into the cellar. We had a house with a big cellar. And um, so the cellar became a significant part of our lives. And uh, father um, fitted out bunk beds for myself and my younger brother down there. And the grown-ups sat in chairs. And it was dank and it was wet and it was horrible and it smelt dreadful. And we had supplies of food down there, mostly in tins but no tin opener as far as I remember. So had we been buried alive, I don't think we could have starved as well before they dug us out. Um, we, we, we had a shelter built in the back of the garage and we all went in, sat in there, my mother and father, myself and the two animals. We used to go down in the downstairs in the shop. We had a, had a side door and a passage and we used, we used to go down there. Well, then they did, the raids got worse and they decided to go across the road to this um, billiard hall. But I only went over the only went over the once because it was so claustrophobic being under these dead billiard tables and all the people crying and coming out afterwards. I said, I wasn't going over there again. I'd sit in our shop and hope for the best. And that's what we did. 
But we did have Anderson shelters inside the house and Morrison shelters outside in the garden, which we could go to. But as we were young, our parents decided the best policy was to take us down the fields, which is, would be less attacked because there's no um, houses there or anything like that. About nine o'clock at night, you used to hear all these people making their way along along the road, all looking for somewhere to spend the night, either a petrol fields, barns, anywhere. And it seemed never ending, all these, uh, because it was normally so quiet that time of night, it seemed, you know, never ending. And then, of course, between six and seven the next morning, we had them all making their way back home. And uh, I, I don't know, I found this, um, very disturbing, really, to think you know that people got to come that far and sleep in those conditions and that. Yes, um, I was I I used to go to um, what they call wear fields, which is now being built on. It was wear fields was a farm, and they had a barn down there, and we used to all go down there. Most of our neighbours as well. And in the barn, and we used to lay on the straw, with it, with it, take blankets with us, and 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 there until, till the raid was over. We used to do that when the air air raid siren went, leave on, you know, whatever time. Uh, well, we had a huge concrete shelter built at the bottom of the road, which was horribly smelly. We, my mother would never let us go in there because it was always wet and damp inside. I think there were bunks in there for sleeping, but no, we never went in there. You could tell the difference between the German planes and the English planes. We were taught to listen, and the kind of double thud of the engines told you those were German bombers and um, so we'd listened for those. They were on their way to Plymouth, of course. Um, it just so happened that we were on the flight path in Exeter, so sometimes when they came back, if they'd got anything left, they would drop them on Exeter. And uh, one night um, at one of those air raids, or just after the raid, I think just after the all clear, our phone went, and um, my father, of course, was out. He was always out during the raids, obviously, because he was out with the wardens. And um, my elder brother went up to answer the phone from the cellar. And I remember him coming back, walking down the stone steps of the cellar with the tears coming down his cheeks, uh, telling mother that um, my father's business had taken a direct hit. Um, we were iron founders in Bonhey Road. And... Um, a bomb dropped, most unfortunately, as it happened. Uh, we had various sheds on, in Bonhe Road, and then the actual foundry part was across the leet that ran through that area um, at the back. And the, this bomb had managed to drop directly onto a big plate, a big steel or iron plate, I'm not sure what, but it was a, if it had fallen anywhere else, if it had fallen in the leet or on the concrete, it would have gone through. But it actually bounced and exploded, so it did a maximum amount of damage uh, to the to the business. And um, I remember thinking, in that sort of straightforward way that children think, you know, what on earth will my father do now? The foundry is gone. What will he do now? It didn't occur to me that uh, they'd still have to find a way of uh, trading and founding and doing all the stuff that they did. The, the first day right before the Blitz was St. Lois, and my father was a special constable when he brought me back a bit of shrapnel from the Blitz <laughs> when he was there working. And then in eight, and he brought me back a bit of shrapnel for it. After one of those random sort of air raids, the following day, my younger brother and I were out in the garden, and we saw a lot of very exotic birds flying around. And that was a bit strange because we were not used to that. But then we remembered uh, that there was an aviary in Culverland Road, off Union Road. And um, so we decided we'd go and investigate. So we walked around to Culverland Road to where the aviary had been, only to discover an enormous crater 
and something sticking out of the middle of it. Now, my younger brother, who was, um, he eventually became an engineer, he al always had uh, a curious, um, you know, curiosity was the name of the game. He needed to know about things. He was only five, I think, at the time. He said, I think we should go and see what it is. And I said, I don't think we should go and see what it is because I was ever the cautious elder sister. Uh, I think we should go home and tell father, which we did. And father then went to investigate and discovered that it happened to be the largest unexploded HE bomb dropped on Exeter up until that time. Um, but it hadn't exploded. It had just created this crater uh, and shot the poor birds into uh, the whole district. So father decided that everybody within spitting distance should be evacuated uh, in case this bomb went off, including our house. Now, my mother flatly refused to go because she had this hen sitting on a clutch of eggs about to hatch at any minute. And she certainly wasn't going to leave her hen in its hour of need. And um, so she stayed, but my brother Nick and I uh, were packed off to the country. My aunt at that time, who was in the Timber Corps, um, that was a branch of the Land Army, a lesser known branch of the Land Army, uh, was running the sawmill at Drew Stainton. So we were put on a bus to go to Drew Stainton into the care of Aunt Nora. Well, the, we, we had quite a thriving youth club here at the time, uh, which was really came about by a whole school was evacuated here during the, in the war. And the headmaster of that, the, the whole lot came. And the headmaster and the local bank manager started the youth club. And of course, we, uh, we joined, I joined. And uh, one night I was in there, minding my own business, business, if you like, and this lad was throwing a darts across a passageway and I walked up through the passage and it went into this eye and uh, then I had to go and I, I walked down to my doctor, Dr. McLean and he looked at it and uh, it was hanging down here and he said that's got to come out. Well I was glad of course because the pain was quite excruciating. Anyway, he said to me, tomorrow you must go to Exeter. And Exeter, I had no idea. Where, and you're not going to believe this, but we were so naive. We, we'd never been out of Colin. That's hard to imagine. I'd never been on a train, never been on a bus. We had never, ever been out of Colin. And from there on in, it was a nightmare. I'd never been in a place like it before in my life. I couldn't understand it. I didn't what it's all about. Anyway, I really talked myself, my way to the Iron Infirmary, asking various people. And suddenly I came face to face with the cathedral. I'd never seen nothing like it. And I, you know, it just astounded me. What goes on in a place like that? I can remember the cathedral being a very gloomy place, partly because um, it was before it was all cleaned up inside and outside. So it was very, very grey because, of course, in the old days, they used to have these big bonfires outside um, and the surface of the walls, both inside and out, was uh, blackened with, with smoke. I mean, you wouldn't recognise the cathedral as it is now, as it was then. And it was very large and rather gloomy and daunting. And, of course, a lot of stuff had been taken out of it, as you know. And um, there, was a, there was a piano, no organ, of course. And um, so, but we, were, we had to go there for various important um, occasions. Oh, it was beautiful. A lovely city, beautiful houses. Exeter was a lovely, lovely place. I absolutely adored it. And I think it's, no, it isn't like it was. It was all like, Exeter, the cathedral closed and very, very beautiful, but people haven't got any idea how, how Hitler knocked it about a bit. Well, yes, Della's Cafe was the place to go for a treat. If you wanted a treat um, or it was somebody's special birthday, you went to Della's. Um, and the great thing about Della's was that um, 
there was this orchestra. Well, I say orchestra, it was a little huddle of, of people scraping and playing, you know, keyboard and stringed instruments. Um, I sort of palm court quartet, really. I think there probably were in four of them, but I think we thought it was very exotic to go to, to Della's. Um, and it was tiered so that you could sit high up and look down on these people. They had beautiful, they used to, we used to go in there for tea mostly, and uh, it was lovely, and they used to cook lovely meals, and they always used to have balls for the old year, see the old year out, and I used to go to those. It was really very lovely, a lovely ballroom, and the, the staff were beautiful. Auntie Queenie, she used to work in Dellers, and I can remember her taking me one day to Dellers Cafe and sitting me on the stairs out of people's way, and I could listen to the orchestra playing while they were dancing. Oh, beautiful. They always had a commission air outside the door and an orchestra playing and little booze up on the second floor, which all looked down onto a pit where the orchestra was, and they were lovely red velvet curtains and brass fittings and so forth. And then there was a most beautiful ballroom. And off the ballroom, there was a, a lovely sort of a, a lounge place where they provided desks and note paper. You could go in and write letters to your friends on their paper. It was a very civilized uh, cafe. It was known all over the world, really. Wherever you went, if you said you lived in Exeter, somebody said, oh, Della's Cafe. And they, so you knew, they knew where you came from. There was an arcade. Did you know about the arcade at Eastgate? Well, really, where the Underground Passage entry is now, just behind there, that was... Um, Eastgate was a big uh, glazed uh, arcade. That I do remember because my mother always had to go to a shop right at the far end called The Needlewoman, I think. There were several small shops in there. Um, and The Needlewoman was where she had to go to get her sewing materials and so on. Um, and I thought that was rather magical, the arcade. It had lovely little shops and uh, all individual. I often at night try and sort of sit and close your eyes and try and visualize High Street as it was and try and name the shops that you can remember. And they were beautiful. Um, the Hunnett Inn. My gran used to take me down there and I'd sit in the garage on a wooden barrel with a bottle of pop and a packet of crisp while she had her Guinness, when Percy Bradford kept it. And Bruford's had the most beautiful clock. Have you ever been told about it? Bruford's the jewellers were opposite us in High Street. And out of their top of their, on the first floor, they had a most beautiful, great big square oak clock with Father Time, uh, a model of Father Time over it. It was absolutely gorgeous, and that all went. It was so. It was a real asset. It was a. It was the talking point of Exeter High Street. Anyway, eventually I did get to the Iron Firmary, and I stood outside this building, and I said, "Whatever's going to happen to me in here?" And bearing in mind I only had one eye, this eye was covered. So eventually they came out and hauled me in. And to this day, I can remember the name of the doctor, the surgeon, Dr. Dykes Bauer. And they had me and they put me to bed. And from there on in, they, they treat, well, from there on, treatment. That was the 2nd of May, 1942. My gran, who was over 80, and my mum were both exhausted. Dad was out on fire watching any all the time. Uh, so. They decided while I was at school that we should go out to Kenton, which is only seven miles out, my grandfather's home, for a few nights sleep, you see. I was most annoyed when I come home and found out. But um, anyway, they they booked a taxi and everything was arranged for our past four. So I went upstairs, this is the funny bit, I went upstairs, I went in the mother's bedroom, I stood at the window, and I looked up South Street, and I looked down South Street, and I said, Goodbye, South Street. 
I won't see you again. And I didn't. Because the next night it was all blown to smithereens. But how I knew, I don't know. I mean, Exeter was bombed in retaliation for bombing Lübeck in Germany. Exeter was called the Jewel of the West in Badecker's Guide. Nobody expected it. I mean, we, there'd been the odd sort of air raid where a plane had come along, possibly dropped, dropped a few bombs because they were unloading on their way back, but that was all. We never really had sort of anything bad. That was one reason why the Blitz was so bad, because um, there was no sort of ACAT guns and uh, barrage balloons and things like that that Plymouth had to keep the planes away. So they just had free reign to do whatever they wanted when they did come. And on May the 3rd, 1942, Jerry bombed Exeter and it started half past one in the morning. And I could not, I really was in a land of, I, I couldn't understand what this was all about. And then, of course, the sky was lit up and everything was burning. And I don't know how, I, I was just in an absolute maze about it. My father got out and put on his special constable's uniform. And he got mother dressed, and myself, I was the only child. We all had to go in the, in the steel shelter in your house when, this, when the sirens went off. We all died on the table. We all had these steel mesh or a cage. We all get in the cage. Uh, my dad was around with the car. He took us out to Tedburn St Mary. And we stopped halfway up Five Mile Hill before you get to Tedburn St Mary. And so we sat in the hedge again, as we did in when we left the house from Powderham Road. Sometimes we would go out to Carrot Lane and sit with other neighbours. But this particular night we went out to Tebbin St Mary and a farmer by chance just came down and saw us there with my mother. And he said, you can't let these three children sleep out in the open. You must come into the farmhouse. And so they took us in and put us to bed. We'd gone to bed and um, my little brother Nick woke me up. Um, we were sharing a bed. It was, it was a tiny cottage. I don't know where Aunt Nora slept. She probably in a chair, but I think it was her bed. And um, he shook me awake and he said, I thought I'd wake you up, Carol, in case you were frightened. Um, so I was by then awake and then Aunt came in and we looked out of the window and the whole of the sky was red. I was with my dad and we had this shelter in the garden and mother and the neighbours went down there. And luckily we stayed indoors for a while and a cindric bomb come through and landed in our bedroom, back bedroom. So we rushed up the stairs because it crashed through and you heard it. So we went up there and luckily it landed in a, finished up in a wicker chair that was there. So my father picked it up and threw it straight out the window into the yard. So that was, got rid of that one, thank goodness. So then... My father, being a special constable, he had to report for duty, so he said we went downstairs and went to look for mother in the shelter in the garden, and they'd all gone. So the father said, well, we'll have to see if we can find where mother's gone, so he said, I'll take her down, perhaps they're gone into the shelters in St Sybil's, right up through the middle of St Sybil's was big shelters and a water tank. And we went up there and we went in the shelter and didn't see anybody. He said, well, I must see where Mother is. And he went off. I, I do not know how many people that, that shelter held, but it was quite the whole terrace actually crammed in there. And I vividly remember, if I smell wet concrete now, that would remind me of the smell of the shelter, because that's what it smelled like. And I can remember as the bombs were dropping, all the women in there going, oh, oh, you know. But there was nowhere to sit down or what few seats there were, and they were already occupied, so you, you were stood up and crammed in 
and there was a warden on the door and he wouldn't allow anybody to go out once you were in there. Um, it, it, and of course there was no, um, no lights in there, no electric, no, uh, no sanitation, a bucket in the corner. Um, it, it wasn't a nice experience, but these shelters were built in a hurry. Um, and I, I think whoever designed them and built them, they did the best they could. And obviously it saved a lot of lives. So I'm grateful to them, because otherwise I wouldn't be here. My cousin was staying with us, and he came up and said, you've got to get out of bed. I was glad I did, but I mean, I... I I really didn't really want to, but it was very frightening when you got down. I mean, you didn't realise it was going to go on for so long and be so bad. But I, I did get up and we had the, as I said, my mum had the dog's head on her lap and I had his bottom on mine and my father nursed the cat and they were all, we were all very, we were actually very, very lucky to get away from it because it was bombs quite near us, but we... We, we escaped quite easily. My father was an air raid warden. And he went out halfway through the raid and did what he had to do and came back again. So when I got into the shelter, lo and behold, mother was in there with the neighbors. So I rushed to the door. But before I got to the door, a bomb came down. It was the only bomb in there was. And it came down between the shelter and the Odeon cinema and killed my father. But I didn't know that at the time. So when the bomb went off, I went back into the shelter. It stayed there till the sun went all clear. Boom, boom, you know, like that sort of noise. And, and that's all, all you could hear, you know, it was the compression of the bomb and the blast of it. You could hear the blast of it, you know. And um, it, it was frightening. It was very frightening to hear it because you wondered whether it was going to drop next to you next, you know. And of course, then they started bringing in the dead people into the mortuary. It was quite an experience for a lad who had never been out of the town, been out of Colin. Yeah, they were bringing them in there on trolleys. I think it was about 130 or something like that. I can't remember the exact figure quite upsetting as well. And it got so bad where we lived, the whole of Power Street, Summerland Street, Belgrave Road, um, Cheek Street, Symbol Street, we were surrounded that they had to evacuate us uh, from the shelter. It got too hot. And I can remember vividly um, they took us through Eads Vinegar Factory, down through to where the garage, where the lorry was, and led us out the double doors at the end of the garage to walk down to, uh, down Belgrave Road to Paris Street. And from there, we went to the Corporation Bus Depot, which was at the bottom of Paris Street. And we were put into an RAF lorry and took out to um, Hevertree Congregational Church, where we spent the night um, in the cellars there. Well, the whole of Palace Street was just about demolished, I think. There was an Elim Tabernacle. That was still standing, I think, but from there downwards, there was a vegetable shop. There was a Palladium Theatre, I believe. There were wine vaults opposite Uncle Shop, and my uncle and aunt and my sister were sheltering in the wine vaults cellars and a landmine came down on them and brought the building down so they had to be dug out rescued they were, they survived and i don't know how many people were with them i don't think anyone was killed but there were people killed in paris street further down uh, i worked with someone her dad and brother i think were killed by the gas main being broken they were buried and the, the gas killed them. And some just died of blast. Some people just, nothing wrong with it. I think the lady in, in the shop next door to my uncle's shop, um, workshop, she was just found dead in bed. Probably the blast killed her. Wow. 
I mean, the noise was horrendous, and sometimes they seemed to be getting nearer and nearer, and then, you know, the planes moved and so forth. I mean, they had to get us out of the shelter because we couldn't breathe, basically. I think that was the reason we were evacuated, because we were surrounded by fire. There was, used to be four of us on duty in Bedford Circus. And we used to go down the Dominic Savings Bank cellar, which was supposed to be the safest place in Exeter. Unfortunately, it proved wrong. Because, and I knew everybody who went on duty in that building, and the four of them that night got killed, unfortunately. One, one was a lad from, he was an evacuee from London, 15 years old. He wasn't old enough to be there, but he was so keen to pick up two and six months. <laughs> he had to be there. I'm an only child, so it was only my mum and dad and myself. And the safest place was deemed to be under the stairs. And we were under the stairs at the time, and there was this terrific noise, obviously the explosion and uh, all the doors and everything rattled, you know, but... It was, it was thuds and the whole building shook. I imagine it would feel like an earthquake. It was, you know, you, everything quivered and, and shook and, and the noise was terrific. And when we went out afterwards, the, the light in the sky with the fires and the smell was, was horrendous. You could read a newspaper out in the garden in the night. It was so light. Yeah. It was it was really frightening. And you realise how lucky you'd been. And everything was on fire. The heat, um, as we walked down Belgrave Road towards Paris Street, on the left-hand side, which is where the houses were, they were all on fire. And um, it, it, it was, I can remember vividly the heat. Um, Somebody once said that the lorry we were in was an RAF lorry and that at one stage it went up on two wheels. Well, I, I don't believe that, but that, that was the story that was told. We had a, a lot of Polish and Czech RAF, well, working in the RAF. Um, and I, I think the Poles were prominent on the night of the Blitz. No doubt about that. Uh, horrendous noise, horrendous damage, but um, I can't tell you much about the actual air raid. <clears throat> the underground passes were used, I understand. The practice was when there was an air raid or any the sirens went, we all evacuated down into the cellar of the pub. We're sound very nice with you, you're sound surrounded by big beer barrels full of <laughs> beer and that. And I've often thought afterwards if we had been hit, if we hadn't been killed by the bomb, we'd been drowned by the beer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, then we, we sat down this down there with family and uh, the licensee and his wife. And it was really um a very frightening experience because everything seemed to be crashing around us and uh, we didn't realise until it was all over and went out just how much had happened so close to us. We were really, really very lucky and uh, we came out and because the pub was almost on the junction, up to the junction of um, Fourth Street and High Street and South Street and the building on the corner of South Street, 4th Street was one massive fire, the heat was terrific from it and everything obviously lit up. Uh, we found later that behind us um, a big shop had been hit. Um, and I, uh, I remember coming coming out of the cellar because the power had been lost, the all electric power and lights and that. And we'd been sitting in the cellar with candles stuck in empty wine bottles. And I came out with one of these bottles in my hand, still lit. And the policeman said they put that bloody light out. And I came out when the all clear went, and I thought, well, 
I'll walk across and look up Auckland Terrace to see if the house is still there. And I walked across, I went to York Terrace, York Road, and there's the high banks there. I don't know if you know York Road is, as it goes up, the pedestrians go up a thing on, on the banks there. I went up there and I looked up there and I saw my house and the back of it was on fire. And there was three RAF men there. So I said, would you come with me and see to this, come out into my house, see if I can do anything to the fire. So they said, yes. So we rushed up Ackland Terrace, went upstairs, and they, I said, bunk me up into the roof because the loft was, the attic thing was in the bathroom. So they got me on their shoulders and pushed me up into the roof space. And the stirrup pump was in the bathroom. And they passed the hose up to me. And I managed to put the fire out. Well, we were wondering, I wonder what we're going to see, you know. Well, when we come up and all we could see was glue in the sky where all the fires was. And of course there was gas mains that had been um, bombed and, and uh, the, the gas was escaping and water was running down the roads. Water, because the water, underwater pipes was, um, you know, bombed. And that was, that was water was flooding and, and everything. So we had flames and floods at the same time. <laughs> uh, that, uh, after it, um, it was a horrible mess uh, all through the city. And right opposite us, um, there was a street then called Waterbeer Street. It's no longer in existence. And there, down there, um, there's quite a bit of damage and where that little church is now in the Gildo Centre. That was about the only thing left standing. And they also machine gun the gas tank, which is a gas and coke company, and flames were shooting out the side of there. I know um, from personal experience, a friend of ours, he was a um, fireman in Plymouth, and they called up the fire engines from Plymouth and all around to help. And uh, they weren't allowed to go in until the planes had sort of gone because there was no defence against the planes. So they had to wait and of course by that time the fires had all taken uh, hold very well. So I went looking for my father. Everybody just told me, oh he's there, he's here, he's there, he's... You come back in a You rep report back what he ever did. Walking up through Exeter after the Blitz with all the hose pipes and all the water running down Four Street Hill and the smell and everybody working and helping everybody else. But it was quite eerie to, to walk it up and f see all the people helping everybody. And the smell is something that the, the sort of cinder smell and the smell of, of bombs and, and wood and so forth, it was really... Is something that you'd never really, really forget. It was, and all the hose pipes all, all laid up the road and so forth. It was, it was quite unusual. 
after you know as you as it was and of course when we came back to Exeter on the morning of the Blitz, we stopped at the top of Dunstert Hill. I think my dad must have come to fetch us. Uh, and we looked at Exeter and it was just smoky and just a mess, just a haze all over the city. And I know my mother said, oh, if our house is gone, we'll go up to Auntie Hilda's in Paris Street. <laughs> Paris Street had disappeared by the time we got home. We, she didn't seem to worry about my brother because he would have been at work as a messenger boy and he did say recently that he remembers going to work pushing his bike and a policeman said to him where are you going son and he said I'm going to work for the GPO and the policeman said it's not there you must go to the Barnfield Hall and that's where the main post office had been transferred. We all had to report to a, a meet outside the Barnfield Hall and the manager had a, 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 a list of staff which he ticked off and after he's seen you all, because the bank had been blitzed, we were sent home. And we, but we used to go up there every day and be and met and then we were sent back again. But they had a meeting there every day. And after the, we were sent home, I used to go to, my friend was a, a domestic science teacher at the school in St Thomas. So I used to go over with her and help cook the food for the people who had been blitzed or, or had lost their uh, gas or electric supply. I felt I'd, cheat, I'd, I'd cheated because I wasn't in here, if you know what I mean. It's silly, but no, that's how I felt. All the people will think what could have happened if the bomb had gone there or the bomb had dropped there or they just look around and see what the damage was fantastic. Really. It was frightening. To, to, you, you couldn't take it in. That all of a sudden, all these shops, all these houses are gone. Mostly through fire, not through bombs so much as the spread of fire, I think. Shortly afterwards, it was called the Baydecker Raids, uh, which again didn't mean the thing, the average Brit, you know. Um, and they didn't tell me for a long time that he'd been killed. So then I had to bring it to, to my mother. I had no brothers or sisters and no relatives handy. So I had to do it on my own. The, the streets was full of um, hose pipes and things. You, and the hand broke them. Of course, all the hoses. I mean, there was sixty-two hoses went in South Street alone. So um, you know, there's an awful lot of clearing up to do. You could not believe that the city, of course, was still smoking everywhere and there was a stench of um, burning timber everywhere. There were roads closed off, there was uh, rubble everywhere, and it took us ages to walk back, to find our way up Pennsylvania to get back into Union Road, because all the shortcuts that we might have taken were all closed off, and there were notices everywhere saying no entry and so on. Um, I mean, it was like walking into a different world. That was extraordinary. And um, I suppose that was a big impact on us to get back to our own home and find, although it was still standing, there was no glass in any of the windows. They had all gone. Uh, there was no electricity, there was no gas, and uh, the water supplies, you know, you could only boil water. Um, and Father, by then, of course, had, had built a sort of field kitchen outside with bricks and um, so... So there was food, and <laughs> and uh, and there were bottles of Corona. Anyway, the matron who was running the the, the iron farmery, she kept tame rabbits, and she sent this boy and I down into the park to collect rabbits' food. So this we did for a couple of, religiously for a couple of days, and then one day we decided we'd go up into the town. I wish I hadn't gone really because it was absolute devastation. Never forgot it.
One of the worst things after the blitz was the smell. Mm. Yeah, you know, and that lasted for ages. You know, the, the decomposition on body parts and that. Uh, I don't know if they recovered all bodies and that, but certainly there must have been a lot of body parts because it wasn't very nice walking up through the high street. It wasn't. Well, everybody pulled together and helped everybody else. It was wonderful. Nobody was nobody was nasty. You spoke to everybody. Everybody helped you. It was it was a lovely. It brought the best out of everybody. It was a lovely atmosphere. I mean, you were you were trying to help people who'd been bombed and and help people, and, and the the atmosphere was 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 lovely. That everybody turned out trumps. They say adversity brings the best out of people, and it really did. But there was rumours going around that, that uh, a bomb had come down uh, and hit one of the underground passes and exploded. Uh, and the rumour was that it had slid down the town towards the river. And I don't know how far it got, and I don't know if there's any truth in the rumour. But it was, it was quite, at the time, there was quite a few <coughs> rumours about it. We had a visit, of course, a royal visit from... Uh, George VI and Queen Elizabeth. And um, so, of course, we went to pay our due respects to the Majesties. We were standing there, and Anne was standing there, and um, a, there was a little old lady with a bunch of flowers that she'd picked in her garden, and it had a little label on it, a little paper label saying Semper Fidelis, the city motto. and. Um, she said to my mother, would your little girl present these to the Queen as she goes by? My mother, of course, said, yes, 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 that'll be fine. And I was thinking, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do this. How am I going to do this? They're in a car. And I was worried. Um, however, my, my elder brother, of course, for whom I used to retrieve cricket balls, tennis balls, anything else, um, had taught me how to throw quite accurately. Um, so I was able to lob this little bunch of flowers high in the air and it fell down in the car immediately between Her Majesty and His Majesty and uh, she she picked up this little bunch of flowers and smiled sweetly and bowed and waved you know in our direction so I was going Whew, I got that right then and um, and my friend Anne turned to me and she said, you shouldn't have done that. And I said, why not? And she said, it might have been a hand grenade. After the blitz, we, don't, we didn't seem to get an awful lot of raids, as I recall. And uh, of course, Exeter was uh, a centre for, for military bases. And that, and when the Americans eventually got in, they, they, they uh, very prominent around here. Of course, the convoys of Americans going up through Devon St Mary towards Oakhampton, always throwing out sweets to us. They were very kind. All the black guys were billeted in the St Thomas Alfington area, and all the white soldiers were billeted on this side of the river. That's how it was. And my mother-in-law apparently was in the cathedral close outside the cathedral, and. Um, there was a black guy walking into the cathedral and there was a, an American soldier saying, you can't go in there, buddy. And um, my mother-in-law took issue with him and said, this is God's house. She had a rather deep voice like that. She said, this is God's house and anybody is welcome. So, um, but of course, you know, in America they, at that time, of course, um, they, were, they were still divided, black and white. So... We had more in common with the Black Yanks than what the, we did with the Whites. They, funny enough, that's, that's how it seemed, because they were always very polite. Very polite people, you know? They did, you didn't get them who wanted to fight or that, or you didn't get them, you didn't get them, not that it, it might have happened, but you didn't get them chasing women like the, what do you call it, like the White Yanks did. I particularly recall one incident involving Americans and uh, a coloured American. Uh, it was on a Sunday and 
was walking walking home I've been up to your place and then we were walking home down to Alfin Street and there was a bit of a shirazzle going on. And, uh, apparently um, there was a coloured uh, American serviceman uh, with one of the local girls on his arm walking quite peacefully up through the high street and two white American soldiers started, you know, interfering. They, you know, pulling the girl away, saying you shouldn't be mixing with these blacks or whatever they call them. Uh, and there's a real chamozzle and fight there, and um, these snowdrops, as they call them, that was the American military police, arrived in the jeep within seconds. And they grabbed this poor coloured fellow and bunged him in the jeep, and off they went and left the two whites who were started it there. And <laughs> at the time, the, the, local people there, you know, I thought it was not, not on really, because the chap hadn't done anything at all wrong. And we was down by the crop, as it, as it was called then, in Birdhouse Lane. The dolphin is still there opposite, and there was two Yanks over there, and a land army girl used to wear the brown hats, and um, breeches, and, and um, they was over there, and they was, I could see she was upset. And there was a policeman stood there because there was a police station down the corner of Burnish Lane. And it said to the policeman, look at the Yanks. I said, it looks like I'm molesting that girl. Are you going to do anything? And he said, we're not allowed to interfere. I said, what? So I said, we will then. He said, I warn you that if you do interfere, he said, you could run yourself in trouble. I said, well, the girl's in danger, I said, of them. So we went over. And I pretended it was my girlfriend. <laughs> and I said, come on. And she was so relieved, she was crying. And they was, they was saying to her, um, are you a guy or a dame? Because she wore trousers. In the meantime, I got this job down at uh, what was Pike's Garage, a big um, Austin dealer in Alfington Street, where the leisure centre is now. Uh, and we were repairing Spitfire wings in there. They used to come in either shot up or damaged with landings, bad landings and that. I joined the Home Guard. I was one allowed to join the army. I, I was asthmatic. So when they test you for your breathing and your lungs, I didn't pass. So I was in the Home Guard. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was based at the Exeter City Football Club, Home Guard office. Losing my father was the worst thing that ever happened because we were so close together. And I was going to go into his business. But I'd have to go. Of course I could. But I still took up the trade as an electrician. And I was an electrician. And I stayed as an electrician. I volunteered against my mother's wishes. I would have been caught up at 18. And if I had refused to join the services, which I could do, I would have been sent to the mines in Wales or other parts of the country. You were being given an occupation that was not in the services, but um, to help the country to go through the war. You got machine gun on one occasion, didn't you? Don't it work? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was working in Coley Road and out near St David's Station, and uh, the siren went, and we put the blackout. We put the uh, shutter things up to the window and. Except for a junior that I had with me, everybody else disappeared, but we were in the middle of doing wages and we had all this money on the table and I felt responsible for it, so I sort of decided that we'd carry on and do the, do the wages. But it, it got a bit, uh, all seemed to be getting a bit too near that we decided to make our way to the shelter, so we came out and dashed down this pathway to, to the air raid shelter and the machine gun bullets went along the wall of the building. <laughs> but, but I was up the top 
doing guttering and that when this bomb and bomber, lone bomber, came across. And I heard the boom, boom, and felt the blood. And I looked up and saw this bomber with the Iron Cross in a flash. And as I say, it went where it went then, I don't know, it went up over South Street somewhere. And I just got down off the ladder. And we're absolutely pulled into this air raid shelter back of the mess, you know. <laughs> you silly idiots. <laughs> and then there was a victory. Then finally it was it was a victory. And the great thing about that was you put on all the lights, every light in the house. Father went round putting on every light in the house and opened every window. And uh, the whole place lit up. It was it was amazing. That was VE Day, uh, the end of the hostilities in Europe. We 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 had nothing during the war. Not anything savoury or, or treatable, as I would call it. So to have this big spread put out with sandwiches and, and jelly and fantastic, lovely. And the street parties were wonderful. Night after night, I think one, we had the tables all up through and all the children had a lovely feast. And a man at the bottom of the road, in Old Vicarage Road, he had a, not a factory, but he was a sort of distributor of sweets. And he sent up a box of Mars bars or something, which we had uh, on the table. So, and then sort of suddenly people discovered jellies and custard and that sort of thing and cake. So we, we had a lovely street party, but it was the evenings that was the best because everybody would be home from work. And uh, a lady uh, halfway down the road, Mrs Miller, opened the windows and she played the piano for us. And then years and years of waiting for stuff to be rebuilt. The brickworks at Pinnell was bombed. They used to have a brickworks at Pinnell was bombed. And so they had to sort of make do with second-hand bricks, clean them off, and they, they was reissued for rebuilding. The city was laid waste. Uh, the high street uh, where once there had been shops there were bricks and rubble and Budlia flourishing because Budlia will flourish everywhere and there were little signs um, I don't know if anybody told you this but there were little signs saying where the shop had been. They gave Dad a wooden hut at the top of the street to work in and he worked in that for a couple of years while well, they rebuilt South Street. Well, they'd taken a shop, a whole shop. But what we got back was three walls with a toilet and um, do your own shop front, do your own everything. So Dad and I were there till gone midnight every night doing a bit more. Fortunately, he was quite good at electrics and things, but. I don't think he'd pass it now, but at the time it was, it was all right. I know one night it was gone midnight and the policeman on the beat came in and said, have you got any opens to go to? And I said, well, if you cut this bit of hardboard for me, we could. So he kindly took his tunic off and cut my whole hardboard and then we went home. But he was ever so nice. I hope he didn't get in trouble. I often at night try and sort of sit and close your eyes and try and visualise High Street as it was and try and name the shops that you can remember and they were beautiful. I mean, I know it's modern times now, but they've, you've lost the... Every, we look the same as every other city, don't we, here, really and truly. I mean, Woolworths Boots and everywhere else has all got the same frontage that you don't know where you are, but we had an individual high street and it was lovely. Well, I was thankful to be home, but uh, I loved that old, old, old house, really. It has stood for 400 years, why should it knock it down? The sound of the siren still gets to me. Um, if it goes up and down, I wait for the all clear.